In this video, we shall discuss the fascinating phenomena of time dilation in context of special relativity. Here, you will see that all the big deal that is made about the time dilation effect between a pair of observers in different inertial frames is coincidental. The same time dilation effect works perfectly well between an inertial observer and a non-inertial observer as well, and that also within the framework of special relativity. I begin with this statement because at the very mention of time dilation, people immediately jump and grab the Lorentz transformation equations and start explaining as if Lorentz transformation causes this effect. It doesn't. Here, we will demonstrate that it does not even strictly depend solely on the invariance of the space-time interval, but it is more of a consequence of the structure of space-time interval. That's it, just the mathematical structure, not the condition of invariance, strictly speaking. The mathematical structure of space-time interval, how it is defined for any given pair of events, infinitesimally close or at a finite separation, the kind of standard mathematical notations that are used, all these have been explained in two of my earlier videos. Links are in the description of this video and I will also put them up in the i button at the right places. So let's get started. But before we begin, let me emphasize some trivial but important and one non-trivial and very important concepts about reference frames that we shall require to understand time dilation. First, the trivial ones. We usually think of ourselves as inertial observers belonging to our reference frame, let's call it S0, and draw the space-time diagram as per the observations taken from our frame. So when I say we observe, I mean observations made from this S0 frame and data taken using the space-time coordinates of this S0 frame. When I say velocity of a person or an object, I mean velocity with respect to us, that is our S0 frame and so on. This is a standard practice in special relativity. Whoever is making a statement, he or she is doing it as per the observations made from his or her own rest frame and unless it is specified otherwise, we will assume this rest frame is inertial in nature. Sometimes it may be necessary to consider how a situation appears to an observer in a frame inertial or non-inertial in nature but different from ours. Whenever we do such a thing, we shall point it out very clearly. Also notice that two inertial frames are distinguished only on the basis of their relative velocities and nothing else. And for any velocity allowed by the second postulate of special relativity, that is velocity less than the speed of light, we have or you have an inertial frame moving with that velocity. And now the non-trivial one. One that you might have not noticed, though it was always in front of you. It is the simple fact that even a non-uniformly moving body, that is an accelerating or decelerating one or even a dancing one, is in some inertial frame or other if we choose to look at it instant by instant. Of course, it doesn't stay put in one particular inertial frame, but at each instant of time, it is in some inertial frame and the very next instant, it changes to a different inertial frame with a different velocity. Next instant, it shifts frame again and so on. To put it in terms of calculus, let's say at time instant t, it has velocity v of t with respect to us. That is, we are the inertial observer is zero, right? So at time instant t, it appears to be at rest in an inertial frame that happens to have a constant velocity equal to v of t with respect to s0. After infinitesimal time duration dt, the velocity of that body will change to v of t plus dt. So at time instant t plus dt, the body is again at rest but in a different inertial frame that is moving with a constant velocity v of t plus dt with respect to s0. Are you getting the point? So, accelerating or decelerating objects can be thought of as shifting through a series of frames. Each frame is inertial in nature, but the object's very own rest frame, that is, the one that is glued to that object, is changing velocity, so of course is non-inertial. With that being clarified, let's now look at the time dilation effect. The first thing you need to know is, the time dilation effect comes only between time-like separated event pairs, that is, such pair of events that are separated by time-like intervals. The other two types, that is light-like or space-like intervals, have nothing to do with time dilation. Why this is so will be explained in a future video, so make sure you stay tuned to the channel. If you do not know about the types of space-time interval, maybe you want to have a look at the video in the i button. For now, let us observe a person moving with non-uniform velocity and draw its world line or space-time trajectory in our space-time diagram. Notice how the slope of the world line is changing with time. This indicates that the velocity is changing continuously maybe due to the change of speed or change of the direction of motion or some kind of complicated motion like dancing or doing cartwheels, whatever. Any or all of these types of motion we collectively refer to as moving arbitrarily. 
the frame attached with this arbitrarily moving guy, his restraint so to speak, let's call it S prime, is clearly non-inertial. Since this S prime guy is present on all the event points that happen to lie on his world line, so in his rest frame S prime, all these events are occurring one after the other temporarily, but all at the same spatial location. In the S prime frame, this location is let's say x prime vector equal to zero, the origin where this guy is at all times. Now consider two events one and two infinitesimally close to each other on the world line of this arbitrarily moving person. I am insisting on infinitesimal interval in particular so that we can use the magic tricks that calculus offers us. You will see. Anyway, the space-time coordinates of these events as per our S0 frame observation are t and x vector and t plus dt and x plus dx vector respectively. Just so you know, these are collectively written as x mu and x mu plus dx mu. For explanation of this compact tensor notation, refer to my video on the space-time coordinates appearing in the i button now. The infinitesimal space-time interval between events 1 and 2 that we as zero observers calculate using our data and denote by ds squared is c squared dt squared minus dx vector modulo squared. This is a standard definition of space-time interval between two infinitesimally close event points in any inertial frame. Square of the difference in time coordinates of the two events minus square of the difference in spatial coordinates. So our task has been trivial so far, taking coordinate readings of event 1 and 2 and putting them in a standard definition. But now we have to figure out the coordinate readings of these events in the S prime frame as well and then calculate the space-time interval as per the S prime frame data. Turns out that is not very difficult either. We have already established that for the S prime guy, all the events on his world line are occurring at the same spatial location, his location. Since events 1 and 2 are two such events, so their spatial coordinate difference as per the S prime frame readings must be zero. All S prime observer sees is a time difference between events 1 and 2 because he sees them separated by a temporal duration, a time duration. So, in terms of the prime coordinates x mu prime of s prime frame, the space-time interval ds prime squared will just be c squared dt prime squared. Now, laws of special relativity dictates that space-time interval between two events is invariant, meaning it has the same numerical value when measured in different inertial frames. But that's for two inertial frames. Our frame S0 is inertial alright, but S' prime is the arbitrarily moving one, so clearly non-inertial. Thus, apparently, we cannot claim that the two intervals ds and ds' prime measured in these two frames are numerically equal. However, we must not forget that we are dealing with infinitesimal intervals here, so we still have the magic of calculus up our sleeves. And now, we are going to use that to show that the two are indeed equal. So let's see how the magic works. We have already discussed that even a non-uniformly or arbitrarily moving object can be thought of as an object at rest in some inertial frame or other if we choose to see it instant by instant. So when our S prime guy was traveling past event 1 at the time t, it had velocity v of t and its momentary rest frame was an inertial frame S1 let's say at velocity v1 which is equal to v of t with respect to our S0. At time t plus dt, the fellow is moving past event 2. Its velocity is v of t plus dt and now its momentary rest frame is another inertial frame S2 at relative velocity v2 that is equal to v of t plus dt again with respect to S0. Can we argue that S1 and S2 are different but only by an extremely small velocity difference? Then we can say that during the tiny tiny time interval dt, when our guy was traveling from event 1 to event 2, he was practically in the same inertial frame. To convince yourself, notice that the velocity difference between the frames S1 and S2 is just V2 minus V1 which is V of t plus dt minus V of t. Expanding V of t plus dt to first order in dt, this difference is just dV dt multiplied by the infinitesimal time dt. So the velocity difference is also another infinitesimal quantity. Now if we calculate the distance traveled in time dt with velocity v of t, it's just v of t multiplied by dt which is equal to the spatial separation dx vector between events 1 and 2, doing the same with velocity v of t plus dt 
which we explained earlier as v of t plus dv dt multiplied by dt. The distance is v of t dt plus dv dt multiplied by dt squared. I know it's too much math, but just hold on for a second and it will go away. Since the second term here is dt squared, that is a square in the infinitesimal, we can happily ignore that term. Thus, we get the same distance traveled in the same time duration even with the slightly different velocities. Thus, you see, as long as we are dealing with infinitesimal interval dt and an infinitesimal spatial separation dx vector, the infinitesimal difference in velocity won't matter. So, we can really think of S1 and S2 as the same inertial frame for this tiny time interval and that's how the magic of calculus works. And finally, we can go ahead and equate ds squared to ds prime squared. Then we bring in their respective expressions in terms of the coordinate differentials in S0 and S prime frames. The equation we get is enough to explain time dilation already. Notice on the RHS, that is the right hand side, the temporal part dt squared is such that only after we subtract the spatial part dx vector mod squared from it, the result matches numerically to the temporal part on the left hand side, that is dt prime squared. Thus, obviously, dt squared is bigger than dt prime squared. This is time dilation at its very raw and real form. It says the time interval dt between events 1 and 2 measured in our clock in a zero frame is bigger than the time interval dt prime between these same pair of events measured by the s prime guy using his clock in the s prime frame. If we are saying the time interval between 1 and 2 is let's say 10 seconds, s prime guy will demand that it is 8 seconds, etc. So, time is dilated for us as zero observers. Now, we can give this equation a little makeover to make it look like what we see in relativity textbooks. We pull out c square dt squared from the right hand side, get rid of the common factor c from both sides, take a square root and ignore the negative root uh, because time doesn't run backwards. Since dx vector dt is nothing but the instantaneous velocity vector of the s prime guy with respect to our s0 frame at time instant t, we may write v of t vector mod square on the right hand side. Notice what we have done here. Since v of t and v of t plus dt is only infinitesimally different, we are saying that s prime guy is effectively moving with the velocity v of t only during the entire duration dt. We can get away with this because it introduces an error that is second order in the infinitesimals, something too tiny to make a difference as we have demonstrated earlier. So now we have an equation that depicts time dilation effect between an inertial observer S0 and an arbitrarily moving observer S prime having a time varying velocity with respect to S0. But this is for infinitesimally closed events 1 and 2. What if the events are far apart so that their space-time interval is finite. Well, then we have to integrate over dt prime and dt obviously. Of course, the result of integrating the right hand side will depend on how the velocity changes with time, that is, what kind of a function v of t is. Note that while the finite time interval delta t prime matches the right hand side numerically, and we do have the time dilation effect for finitely separated events as well, but the idea of invariance is lost as we integrate. See, this integration is just summing many, many pieces of infinitesimal intervals, right? Each of these pieces is invariant in reference to a different pair of inertial frames. On one side of the pair, we have our S0 frame. On the other side, we have the momentary rest frame of the S prime guy that is scheduled to change after every tiny time duration dt. Therefore, when we are referring to the finite interval as a whole, we no more have just one pair of inertial frames. We have many, many pairs. On the one side of the pair, just our S0 frame as usual, but on the other side of the pair, there are the series of momentary rest frames that the arbitrarily moving guy kept shifting through. This series of momentary rest frames, each inertial in nature, but each with slightly different velocity from the next one or from the previous one, collectively is nothing but the S prime frame that we know is actually glued to this arbitrarily moving guy, therefore non-inertial. So for even pairs separated by finite space-time interval, the question of invariance doesn't really arise, except for one unique situation, when instead of an arbitrarily moving guy, we have a uniformly moving guy. In that case, all this complication of momentary rest frame 
is unnecessary because a spring frame itself becomes inertial then and the factor under the square root in our equation is just the time independent constant that can be pulled out of the integration easily rendering the integration trivial this last equation is what you will see in all relativity textbooks where not only the time dilation works but the idea of invariance is also intact because now we are dealing with just two frames our s0 which is inertial anyways and this guy's s prime which is now inertial since the guy has started to move uniformly so we have derived the equation depicting the time dilation effect not only for a pair of inertial observers but also for a more general situation where one frame of the pair is moving with non-uniform velocity. What you see in most textbooks is a derivation using Lorentz transformation equation which essentially blindspots you to this more general scenario because Lorentz transformation relations by their own definition relate the space-time coordinates of a pair of inertial reference frames only. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about in this video. Actually, there are a couple of more things that need to be addressed in connection with time dilation effect. For example, I did not explain the very famous and very confusing statement, moving clocks run slower and so on. But this video has become somewhat longish, so let's do that some other time. So please stay tuned. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.